Hey gang, welcome back. This is going to be Jade Part 27. This is really a continuation of Jade Part 26, which was the installation of this fender patch from Spectra. In that video I showed how I cut off the bottom half of this fender, fitted this patch, and then welded it in place. Now also in that previous video I talked about how this had surface rust and I showed that as I pulled it out of the box this patch had surface rust on it and it still does. So I want to address that in this video. I also may do some, or I want to do some bodywork type stuff on this transition and also up here where the radius runs um, or the corner runs for the wheel arch or wheel opening. Now this Rust is not a major issue. This is really just barely even surface rust. And I say that because, I mean, if you took a really light sanding disc, you could remove this. So that's one way to address it. But I want to do it a different way because there's chemicals out there that everybody sells or advertises or uses or whatever that addresses some of this rust issue. Now you may have some deeper rust some pitting and stuff like that and I believe this product I'm going to show you will also address that. So I'm going to go over that a little bit and, and get that started and I also need to drill some holes. On the previous video as I showed the installation there is a hole that is supposed to be here in the forward part of the fender for the little strut brace and then in the rear where the mount bolt goes up into the rocker panel there is no cutout so I have to make my own cutout for that to make it appear correct or look similar to what would be factory. Again, this patch panel is by Spectra and it's, it's, it's close. You know, it's going to need attention. Um, there are other panels. I don't know if anybody makes this patch panel. I know this is what was available and this is what I'm using. So let me get started and show you what I'm going to do with this rust. Now, as I said, you could just sand this off and just take a light sanding disc. This is a uh, 3M, I don't know what grid it is, but it's a yellow disc, so it's not very aggressive. Uh, the one that is less aggressive is a white disc, but I'm gonna, just going to show you this with this yellow one. So if I wanted to, I could just sand some of this. And that will take it off. However, I want to do something a little bit different because you can't always sand off the rust that you see. Like I said, it may be uh, a little deeper as far as pitting. So what I want to use is this chemical that I've used before. And I, I don't know if I did a video on this or not. I may have done a video on the roof for Jade. And this chemical is 3X Chemistry and this is rust dissolver and it shows on the front here this looks like a, a manifold that one half was dipped in the product and the other half was left sitting and it basically will do just about that so there are you know of course there's going to be warnings and all these different things on the back and you know i'm not going to read through all of them but if you look that up it'll give you some idea of what you're what to expect um, this says it'll, it'll dissolve or removes light rust in 30 minutes, moderate rust in 4 to 6 hours. So just know that. And heavy rust in 8 to 12 hours. So what they're suggesting with this is, you, you know, obviously if you have some heavy, heavy rust, you're going to let that thing be coated or soak in this chemical for that period of time. And it's also water soluble. So... Um, Points out here, rust dissolver works like an acid, but is safe for you and environment. Its advanced acid replacement technology is 100% active and reusable. So that's kind of interesting. But, uh, In this case, you can apply the rust dissolver with a brush, and keep the surface wet, temperatures need to be above 50 degrees. You can immerse it in a plastic uh, pan. So, and there's other, area, other uh, techniques where basically it's saying uh, pump system for large areas rust dissolver can be applied using a catch and return system with small submersible pump 
So I've used this before, and I'm, I've been really impressed by it. So I'm going to get started and put some of this on this. Before I get too far along, I do want to read this warning. Danger may be corrosive to metals, causes severe skin burns and eye damage, may cause respiratory irritation. Keep out of reach of children. Now normally I would wear a respirator for this, but because I want to be able to talk a little bit and it's hard to do that with a respirator, plus I have decent ventilation going on right now, I'm going to put a little bit of this into this little plastic container. I do have a basic, this is like a chip brush, you can get it um, Harbor Freight, they call these chip brushes because machinists use these to clean off chips when they're machining and I'm just going to use that as my applicator. So I'm going to apply this and really I'm going to try to cover this whole the whole panel really. I, it's Since I'm here I'm going to make use of the space I don't know if you can see that or not, that is already changing color. The rust is coming off with the brush. But I'm going to let this be on here for about 15 minutes. And I just, I may let the camera run. I don't know. And I'll do a time lapse on that. Or a speed up or whatever. Now you can see why I like this stuff. So to neutralize it, I'm just going to spray it down with water. If you wanted to, you could take it outside, spray a hose on it, but this works. some paper towels really doesn't leave much you know, as far as residue and now I'm just gonna let this air dry for a little bit I may take a blow nozzle and blow on it as well but that's all I'm going to do at this point. See how nice and shiny that metal is. Oh. Try not to get too much reflection coming at it. You can definitely see where the spots were, but it really doesn't matter. It's the rust is neutralized. Now from this point on, I won't touch this with my bare hands because you have oil and moisture in your hands that will affect this. So I'll always have gloves on. One more thing I want to do before I go any further is that in that first video I talked about this transition. And let me turn the camera just a little bit. Because this panel came up and then dipped back. So it's, it's called a joggle, but it really creates the flange. The end result is this portion right here where the, where the the bend line would be is just slightly higher than the upper side of the panel and you know that'll be addressed with filler but if I take a hammer and dolly and I knock that down just a little bit basically I want to make contact with that high point as far as I can all the way across I know that there's inner structure here that I can't get past but anything I can uh, do up here to make it less noticeable that means less material so I'm just going to back this up on the inside and just try to hammer that down just a little bit. I 
like I said, it may be a small difference, but it's a difference. Now before I get into doing any of the filler work, I still need to address this hole right here. If you look at what's left of the original fender, it had an oblong hole because it was designed to move a little bit with that nut plate or nut clip that went on there. And you can see this, the shape of this is a little more defined. I'm not going to worry about that. This is adequate for what it's being used for and it's not that big a deal. What I'll do is I'll, I want to cut off or trim down this little flange because I've said before and somebody mentioned in the previous video, Spectra leaves you extra material so it's up to us to remove it. So to do that I'm going to use some 36 grit you can see there, 36 uh, 2 inch sanding discs and just knock that down or grind it out I should say obviously wearing earmuffs and safety glasses and gloves Now again, I say this this uh, hole is not that critical. It's just holding a strut, and you know the, the dimensions on the original is about three eighths by about five eighths of an oval, and then this edge distance from the inside is a little over a quarter of an inch. Again, I'm going to stress that that's not that critical, but I still want to get close to it. So, you know, if I take my little six inch scale and, you know, draw a line, come up, come up maybe a little bit less than three eighths, and then just shape it. And this is just a rough rough kind of dimension. Um, I'm just going to take a drill bit and you could use the 3 8 if you wanted 5 16 I think this is uh, somewhere around 5 16 and I'll put a block of wood behind it. Obviously I don't want to drill into my hand. I'm going to make a couple holes next to each other Almost done. Now I'm going to take a tool. This is a little straight grinder, Harbor Freight, and this is you know called a rotary file. Some people may call it a burr, but these are available in kits. So I'm going to take that and try to carefully open that up just a little bit. Again, hearing protection. Safety glasses. That's the hard part because as this is spinning, it wants to grab and go. And if you ever use like a um, uh, rotor zip for doing sheetrock, you'll know that you have to be careful with that because it'll just take off and you'll cut a big hole in your sheetrock. So when you, if you're using something like this and it starts to run away from you, just let off. Just stop. <laughs> It's 
standard bolt. That should work just fine. Now simply enough, all I want to do is create a center line on where it, the bolt hole is. Then I can just take one of these little discs and eyeball it center and just follow the shape. And then I can adjust as I need to. I'm a little bit off. Because really it's just it's just an opening. It's it's nothing overly critical. Here's a good cut off wheel. So now what I want to do is work on this edge because I need a, a cleaner, crisper line. And to do that, I'm going to use stranded fiberglass, Evercoat. And it's kind of hard to move the camera around and show me mixing and everything all in one shot. So I'm kind of working it all into one sequence here. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. And don't forget, there's links to this on Amazon. Order now. <laughs> and with that blue hardener, it's really hard to get a good assessment on color change. So I just keep mixing it up for a little while. And I'm also using these clean sheets. If I haven't shown you those before, they're very handy and effective. You just finish up with what you're doing on this one and then tear it off and you get another clean one underneath. So again, I'm just working on this edge. So I'm going to apply in a way that will let it build that up. Kind of tricky to do without getting my head in the way. Now, I'm not saying you have to use fiberglass, but it, it's a little bit stronger than regular filler. That's that should be pretty obvious. So it'll take maybe some you know impacts from uh, rocks or anything coming up from the road. already starting to get hard. Good mix. That'll be just fine. Alright, so now that this is hardened up, I'm going to go to my normal 100 grit 3M paper and start shaping it just a little bit.
And I like these Durablox. I also have those listed on Amazon. Very handy. Getting into radiuses. And I know I've shown this before, but I am doing a crisscross type of pattern. I'm not just following the curve. So I will do some strokes this direction, you know, and just change your pattern up, and that way it follows the shape of the fender. This is going to be a while, but you get the idea. I will also follow this shape. And I'll probably just use the uh, squared off block. It's just a little easier to handle. There you can actually see some bare metal coming through. And that's okay. I'm just getting the basics in place at the moment. I think at this point, I'm going to blow this all off and clean it, obviously, but I'm going to add some more filler on this edge. It's just not quite enough there to make the shape that I want, so I'll have to add some more material to that. So, I'm going to keep on sanding. I know, you're thrilled. <laughs> You get the idea. I thought I would give you a different perspective. You see a little bit of bare metal there, and that's from where the weld seam was. I did tap that down just a little bit to help with the transition. There will be more filler added, but that's worked out pretty well. You can see the radius, very consistent, and even the shape. I've got it flowing and transitioning as it should be. If I compare that to the passenger side fender, this transition actually drops way down almost to the bottom of the fender. So I did the same thing with this one. You can look down across that direction. I know it's hard to tell, but and basically that's the same idea that I, you know, I, I used the round dura block and did that crisscross pattern and did not allow myself to you know destroy this edge I also uh, in, in, in essence use the flat block and follow the pattern as well and uh, mimicked what would be the correct shape so pretty happy with that now the last thing I want to do at least to this and I may, 
I may go ahead and do it now, but is to shape this corner because you know it's it is rounded, but it's very subtle, and it's not going to take much to get that shape. The next part, though, and I'll show you that when I do that. But the next part is I want to put filler up here, and I'm going to use my regular Rage Ultra, and you know, there's always debate about using epoxy primers on top of or underneath body filler. And I've read many forums that go both ways. Ideally, and this is just my perspective, you want to you want to put filler directly to bare metal. And in this case, this metal's been treated and protected or you know with that uh, 3X chemistry product. But then, but, but the debate goes on about whether you put it on top of epoxy or not. The instructions will tell you that you can go directly on top of OE paint. And I've done it both ways. I've done it the bare metal. I've done it onto epoxy. And in this case, I'm going to do both. I think the conflict overall is the fact that epoxy, being a two-part chemical mix, has to cure. And so people that go too fast, like they let this, they'll put the epoxy on and they might wait 24 hours and it's really not fully cured. This epoxy that's on this fender, it's been on here like over two months, maybe longer. So there is no more curing for this epoxy. So I'm not going to take this down to bare metal. I will scuff this. I will go over it, and make it you know a little more, a little scratched up, so that it has something to bite into. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to go over both of these and build a transition with the uh, Rage Ultra. All right, I thought I thought I had the camera on, but I guess I didn't. And I was talking to myself, I guess. <laughs> but what I was talking about using was this just little piece of sandpaper putting it under my thumb and just following that radius and as I go back and forth I want to use my other thumb or whatever and feel that transition and if something feels like it's still a little sharp go over it some more and break that edge it's what it's called breaking the edge so at this point I've already gone over it it feels pretty good you know it doesn't take much So, at the next stage, what I want to do is work on this area up here, and what I'll do is I'll scuff this. I may just use some of this 100 grit just to just to put some scratches in it, and then I'll clean it with some uh, some Windex or well, I'll clean it with some Windex, and then I'll put some layers of Rage Ultra on top of this.
nice consistent color. I'm really just doing this up here to fill in some of the scratches. You probably can't tell, but I'm putting a little bit of pressure with my thumb in the middle there just to curve this just a little bit. And at some point you have to say, stop touching it. <laughs> Okay, I filmed that whole thing, and I will, well, when you see this, I'll have it time-lapsed or sped up or whatever and chop out sections, <clears throat> but I will also show how much time I actually spent sanding that down. I know you'll find this out, out of sequence, but anyway. You may have seen that I pointed down here earlier, and the reason for that is I could feel something, and I want to show you this little trick. You can take a paper towel, you can fold it over, and you can take your hand, and if you're not really good with feeling dents or imperfections, you can take your hand and glide over it with a paper towel, and it, it accentuates those imperfections. It'll show up more, you'll feel it in your fingertips. So I can feel there's still kind of, this is really kind of high in essence because I can come up and then my hand kind of wants to wave up a little bit over it. Just a very tiny little bit but I can feel it. Down here there's a little bit of a kind of a dent right here. So I may, may end up just skimming this whole thing over and you know smoothing that up. Um, otherwise the rest of this feels pretty decent but I'm probably going to do a little bit more anyway. But that's just a, a technique you can use. So be prepared, you know, when you do stuff like this, a lot of this ends up on the floor. And obviously I was wearing a dust mask, but that's the nature of the beast. So once you start sanding, you're going to lose material, and that's why you put, you know, a little bit extra on there. And I probably could have gotten away with a little bit less than what I actually put on here, but that's how it is. Well, since I've covered this whole area here, I decided to get out the Baxter. This is from Harbor Freight, and so far I've been really happy with it. But I'm going to use that to knock some of this down.
Now I know I've talked about this many times before. When you're block sanding, when you see metal, it's time to stop. Okay? So this has a little bit of deflection here from where I roll that edge around. And like you can just see right there that you can see the color or not. There's a little wedge of uh, darker green or bluish green right there and a little bit right there but there's a high spot so I can't sand that off without hitting more metal so at this point I'm gonna add just a little bit of filler on this edge and then sand that down so that that'll take care of this edge also if you can see the color change here that's almost down to metal that's almost down to metal this is all very thin there's not a lot on here, but it gives you this nice, smooth transition all the way down to the bottom of the fender. Sometimes when you put filler on and you end up with a, you know, a stripe, let's say, and it doesn't feather correctly, like this up here where it's fading out real nice along the edge, that's what you want. You want it to look like that. But sometimes, even at that, you end up with, let's say I just went straight across here, and you could end up with kind of a... A hump. Even though you've sanded it and gone different directions, you could still end up with somewhat of a hump there. So, by doing this and bringing it all the way down to the bottom, now I've got a nice clean transition all the way down. All right, so I've taken an air hose and blown the fender off. As you can see, I have it upside down on my stand. Let me take a little bit of Windex. Just trying to get any kind of dust out of it, clean it, make sure there's no contaminants. There's other things you can use for that. There, there's actually products designed and sold by paint stores, and you're more than welcome to use those. I'm comfortable using Windex. If you want to use it, fine. If you don't, get some stuff from the paint store. I should also say that I, I've sanded below, or it's technically above, where the filler is, scuffed all this up in this section so that I can take the paint and have it, you know, overlap this uh, old epoxy that's already on here. So, just so you know. So once that is done, I'll again take my air hose and blow this off because any moisture that's in here, I need it gone. And the air is going to make that go away. Another thing that's good to do, and probably more critical when you're spraying actual paint, clear coat, and that sort of thing, but you can use some of these these wipes. Uh, this says Surgical Blue Super Tack Rag, so Tack Rag, and these are reusable. You know, you fold them fold them over on themselves. But I'm going to wipe this down one final time just to make sure. Man, it's still pretty clean. There's really no residue showing up. And I store that in a Ziploc bag. Alright, now that I have all the filler work done and I'm happy with the way the fender looks, I'm going to spray it with epoxy. Now this is Shopline Epoxy Primer JP377 and this is a PPG product. And of course this is the hardener JH3770 and I'm using these little cups and this is from 3M these are called PPS cups and really simple instead of using a cup that you have to rinse out every time you use it you put this little liner in and then it has this really neat little cap that has a screen built in so it keeps contaminants or anything it may have gotten into the paint when you were mixing it and all it does is snap into that 
and then it has a collar. So and you once you have it all mixed up and you need to let this sit or anything, you can take this little plug and put it in the cap right here. And that will hold that, you know, keep air out, let it sit for a while. Now with epoxy, you have to mix it, let it sit about 15 minutes so it's ready to spray. So I'm going to mix some of this up and I'm not sure exactly. I'll have to figure out what amount that I want to use. Um, according to the can here, it's a two to one mix. So two parts of epoxy to one part hardener. So normally I would, I would do this wearing a respirator, just so you know. But I want to show you how I'm going to uh, make this happen. So what I normally do, hopefully you can see that okay. Make sure there's no dust. Open up the can. And you can see I, I've used this can you know, quite a bit, but I don't have a lot of paint showing up on the edges. And there's really not that much paint left in this can. But I still, I'm not going to use all that. So just a little paint tip here, spray tip, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can take some, some tape. And I've shown this in other videos, but you take some tape and you put it across the lid at an angle. Make sure it seals good. You take a second piece and you go against that angle. And basically, you create kind of like a uh, spout, I guess is the word I want to say. So there you can see. Now if I take this and I want to go two to one, this has increments listed all the way around. There's a sleeve in here that has all kinds of numbers on it. Two to one, one to one, three to one to one, you know, various ratios that you would use when painting. But I like to use, in this case, going two to one, I'll use the scale that has ounces on it. Because I can just say, okay, I want four if it's two to one, I, use, I start with four and I go to six. So that's just an easy way for me to calculate it. All right, so make sure you put the cup in there. You'll have a mess if you don't. <laughs> so you take this, and like I said, I'm looking for, I don't even know if I need four really, but I'll, I'll mix up four just because. So I'm going to go pour that out. And I'll get to my four. And now, pull that tape off and you have no mess. And the other part is going to be two ounces of hardener. Actually, it won't be two ounces. It'll be because that's that, that increment is four. Five is actually two and a half ounces. Six is three ounces. So four is two and I'll add one ounce and that'll bring me up to the six. Now if you want, wipe that off with a little bit of lacquer thinner on a towel and save yourself some trouble having that seal on you. So I keep a little bottle here, it's like a, kind of like a ketchup bottle. This was actually had alcohol in it at one time and I'll use that just to clean that top a little bit. And recap it. Now I can take a paint stick and just mix that up. The really nice part is, like I said, it's going to have to sit about 15 minutes. 
So I'll mix that. Put a little cap on. I want to make sure it didn't push the liner down inside. Put the retaining ring on. And then I put my little plug in. That also conceals the fumes. So I can shake that up now and not worry about spilling anything. Now, the one thing is when you have these PPS cups, you have to get an adapter that takes them. So this little gun here, primer gun, that's the adapter. And they sell these at the paint stores. And basically you can see it's got cutouts all the way around. And these little ears that are on this cup, those lock together. So I'll push it on and rotate it, and that locks it onto the gun. And then when I'm done, turn the gun upside down, pull the trigger, release the, uh, any pressure that's in there, and then go back into the cup, pull out the, I, this, in this case I store it with a, a little plug with lacquer thinner in here. I pull that out uh, before I put the cup in, obviously. But when I remove the cup, then I can clean this out with lacquer thinner and, of course, go through the normal cleaning processes for your gun. It just reduces a lot of material. So I'm going to let this sit and get ready to spray. All right, so with this all wiped down, I just want to say a couple other things. One, I'm spraying this in my open shop up front. I'm not doing it in the paint booth. But I'm not going to have paint going all over the place. It's going to be contained to this fender because this gun doesn't spray a great big pattern with all kinds of high pressure. It's not like spraying a clear coat where you have to have lots of air pressure and uh, lots of volume, let's say. So I, this will be pretty contained. I'm reshooting this segment because I inadvertently turned the camera off when I was showing you the installation of the little PPS cup. So I'm going to try to do this again without making a mess. And basically, you would slip this on there you go and lock it in place and now you're ready to spray so again I'm going to spray the front section here I'll probably put some on the back and that really isn't a concern right now I'm just trying to show you how to take care of this front outer area but I will spray it on the back where I welded it and later on I'll come in with some seam sealer or undercoating or something like that to cover this area but any exposed metal back here I'm going to put some epoxy on so I'm going to get my respirator on and spray this. Well, well, well. What do you think of that? I think that looks pretty darn good. I wanted to do a little bit of filming while it still had a sheen on it. And you could see any lines or, you know, shadows and that sort of thing. There is a little dent right there. Hard to see, but it's there. <clears throat> so that'll be addressed. And that's, you know, the thing is I'm in the... I'm in process here. I'm not 
completely finished. I just wanted to address this area. So you can see there are standing scratches within this. I probably could have gone over this with some 180 grit, make it a little nicer, but I really just wanted to show you how this process works and that you can do this in your home garage, really. Yeah. I am happy with that. Much better than what was there before. All right, so that'll be the end of this video, Jade Part 27, which is really Part 2 to 26. So if you're just getting on to this video and you are curious as to what else is going on, go back and look at 26 and get an idea of the patch that I installed on this fender. I don't think it's that hard. Of course, I know I do this a lot and I have a great deal of experience, but things like this, really just sanding and filler and primer, you can do at your home. You know, you don't have to have some big fancy shop. You don't have to have all kinds of super expensive tools. You can get the same results. It just takes a little practice and a little patience. So hopefully you found that useful. I know I'm happy that I got this done and got this little section of that car out of the way. And um, again, that's it. So thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. And if you don't mind, leave a comment. That helps as well. And don't forget, I do have an Amazon page, and I've linked a bunch of stuff on there recently, so I'll put that in the description as well. And if you're interested, I do have a Patreon page, you know, so if you want to become a patron, that's great. I'm not forcing anybody to become a patron. I make these videos, I put them on YouTube, there are other people out there who they want to show you a little bit of a video, and then force you to make, you know, make payments to them so you can see the rest of it. I'm not going to do that. I don't think that's right, but that's just me. So if you want to, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. And uh, other than that, I hope you have a good weekend. And until next time, take care of yourselves. Hey, gang. Welcome back. As I said in my previous... <clears throat> hey gang, welcome back. This video is going to be Brooklyn Pony. No, it's not. You're still here?